Some in the media and on the left are calling out people for labeling the virus the same way that many of them did just weeks ago. You're starting to hear the Republicans, especially Trump Co., calling it the Wuhan or the Chinese coronavirus. The, the Chinese coronavirus. Labeling COVID-19 a foreign virus. A foreign virus. Foreign virus? As a, quote, foreign virus. It's going to come across to a lot of Americans as smacking of a xenophobia. As a, quote, foreign virus. Uh, that, that, I think, was interesting because, as I was talking to sources earlier this evening, one of the points that the president wanted to make tonight, wanted to get across to Americans, is that this virus did not start here, uh, but that they're dealing with it. Now, why the president would uh, go as far as to describe it as a foreign virus, that is something we'll also be asking mm -hmm. questions about. At least six people have died from the Wuhan coronavirus. The Wuhan coronavirus has now surpassed the 2003 SARS outbreak and the number of lives it's claimed. Yep. Having to deal with it, the total number of deaths from the Wuhan coronavirus, it's now surpassed the SARS outbreak. There are now 11 confirmed cases of the Wuhan coronavirus. New information about how the Wuhan coronavirus is spread. Okay, why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bi bias against Chinese Americans in this country. That they are furious with the Chinese government. That's because, just as you said, John, they are now claiming that potentially the U.S. military could be to blame for the Wuhan virus, uh, which originated, as we know, in Wuhan, China. China certainly feels that is what happened, what is happening now uh, with people calling it the, the Wuhan flu or the Wuhan virus or the, the China virus. This is a virus that came from the territory of China, but came from bats. This is a bat virus, not a, uh, a China virus. Uh, it doesn't speak Chinese. It doesn't target Chinese people. Uh, it targets human beings who happen to touch their eyes, nose, or, or mouth. I would, I would always be skeptical. Uh, I think they, they handled this in the beginning with a great deal of secrecy in China. They forced the, the initial whistleblower, a doctor, to to recant and issue a letter effectively of, of confession saying that he was sped, uh, spreading illegal rumors and then he, he died from the, from the, uh, from the COVID-19, the disease caused by this coronavirus. where the coronavirus pandemic began is bringing back strict measures to control a new outbreak. China has locked down at least 29 communities in Beijing, where officials confirmed dozens of new cases after seeing almost none in that area for nearly two months. Widespread testing is also underway in the region. Ramey Innocencio shows us how the Chinese government is now preparing for the worst. This wholesale food market is China's newest epicenter in its battle against coronavirus, the size of more than 250 football fields. The Xinfadi market claims to be the biggest in Asia and supplies up to 80% of the capital's meat and vegetables. Authorities moved quickly, putting up barricades around the market and isolating neighborhoods with infected people. Health officials are now launching a massive testing campaign targeting all the market's workers, recent visitors, and anyone they came in contact with.
That's up to 200,000 people on top of the 90,000 residents living nearby. At least as many people are on lockdown across the city of more than 22 million. Massive housing blocks under quarantine with food deliveries going no further than perimeter roadblocks. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't worried, said this woman. Right now, there aren't many people on the subway. There aren't as many as before. It's all reminiscent of the unprecedented lockdown of Wuhan and central China from January, where an estimated 35 million people were impacted. After the world's first coronavirus outbreak was identified at another food market. China's chief epidemiologist Wu Zunyo says the next few days will be critical to understanding how the virus spreads. It may also help us understand what happened in the Wuhan. That environment, uh, particularly the cold, wet environment, may be uh, able to keep the virus survival for a long time. Beijing officials are now barring residents from high-risk areas from leaving the capital. Flights are still extremely limited, and health checks are the norm at all airports and railway stations. Allison, just when it started to feel better, when all of the restrictions that have dictated life for the past five months here were finally easing, it's all back. The temperature checks, the mass testing, the briefings to update case numbers. This time the outbreak is in Beijing, and it's triggering concerns of a second wave of infections across China. And it's also reminding people here that the coronavirus doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Authorities are rushing to contain the outbreak, which is linked to the Xinfa Di wholesale food market. This is a huge place that supplies about 80 percent of the city's food supplies, so they're taking it pretty seriously. At the end of last week, there were three cases that were linked to the market. Now that number is nearly 80, most of them employees of other food companies who had visited the market. Now, they're also raising concerns about imported salmon. After dozens of environmental samples, these are samples taken from the market itself, not from people, came back as positive. The outbreak and the reaction to it is still triggering worry of a second wave of infection here in China after Beijing managed to make it through the worst of the pandemic with only several hundred cases. Remember, this is the political heart of China, so the restrictions have always been tighter here. The city went 56 consecutive days with no new cases until now. Only recently had the emergency level here been downgraded, and things were starting to relax. Some kids were going back to school, attractions had reopened, and events were being scheduled. Well, that's now all come to an abrupt end. Officials are adamant this will not be a second Wuhan, though they're warning there is a high risk that this outbreak will spread.
Concern is growing this morning over an outbreak of a new SARS-like virus in China. At least six people have died from the Wuhan coronavirus. The Wuhan coronavirus. The Wuhan coronavirus. The 34-year-old ophthalmologist diagnosed Saturday with the Wuhan coronavirus. The Wuhan virus. The Wuhan coronavirus. The Wuhan coronavirus. What more can you tell us about the similarities or differences between SARS and the Wuhan coronavirus? The Wuhan coronavirus. The Wuhan coronavirus in China. The Wuhan uh, coronavirus. The Wuhan coronavirus. From the Wuhan. Uh, coronavirus. Wuhan coronavirus. Fears continue to grow over the outbreak of the Wuhan coronavirus. Wuhan coronavirus. The Wuhan coronavirus. The Wuhan coronavirus. We have new information about how the Wuhan coronavirus is spread. Tying coronavirus to China and Chinese people isn't just a racist dog whistle. It's a whole racist orchestra. It's a mighty, mighty racist boss tone. I hear Stephen Miller in this foreign virus setting up travel bans for the outside invasion of the disease, that's not the, the way Chinese it's... coronavirus yeah, that they've th- been that's calling. not the first U.S. case of Chinese coronavirus. The Chinese coronavirus. Uh, this is coming as the Chinese coronavirus. China's coronavirus outbreak. China's coronavirus. Outbreak anxiety. The death toll nearly doubles in China's coronavirus outbreak. China's coronavirus. Just how bad is China's coronavirus crisis? China's coronavirus outbreak. China's coronavirus outbreak. China's coronavirus outbreak. China's coronavirus. China's coronavirus. China's coronavirus. China's coronavirus. Concerns about the China uh, coronavirus. Uh, it's going to come across to a lot of Americans as smacking of a xenophobia uh, right. to use that kind of term. This past Friday, a long-anticipated and much-debated report by the World Health Organization was delayed again. It was supposed to be a kind of post-mortem on a trip to China by a WHO-led team of international scientists, which took place earlier this year. The question How did SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, originate? Jamie Metzl, former NSC official in the Clinton administration and member of a WHO advisory committee on genetic engineering, is one of more than two dozen experts, including virologists, who signed an open letter earlier this month calling for a new international inquiry with a return to China. I wouldn't really call what's happened now an investigation. It's essentially a highly chaperoned, highly curated study tour. Study tour? Study tour. Everybody around the world is imagining this is some kind of full investigation. It's not. This group of experts only saw what the Chinese government wanted them to see.
workers face a huge challenge trying to contain this season's flu outbreak. It is the most widespread in recent years, with at least 37 child deaths reported so far. The biggest clusters are in the South and West. Dr. Anthony Fauci is director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He's part of the effort to fight future outbreaks. He joins us from the headquarters of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Fauci, good morning. Always good to see you. Good morning. First, let me ask you this. Why is this year's virus so deadly? Individuals with underlying conditions as well as children from birth to four years old. And also, as we know, the vaccine this year, although it's always best to get vaccinated, is not the perfect vaccine. It is not, uh, as we would say, favorably uh, uh, efficacious in the sense that we only don't know right now what the efficaciousness is going to be, but it likely is not going to be much more than around 30 percent. I say that with some trepidation because I don't want people not to get vaccinated. Every type of, inf of protection against against the virus with a vaccine is better than no protection at all. So a combination of a vaccine that doesn't work very well and a really bad virus. So given that combination, Dr. Fauci, what should people do? Well, the first thing you should do, and again, getting back to vaccination, if you have not been vaccinated, you should get vaccinated. That's for sure. Then if, in fact, you do get infected, uh, if you have what looks like it's going to be a serious infection, don't hesitate to get to a health care provider who can get you an anti-influenza antiviral like Tamiflu. This is particularly true for people who fall into the risk categories where complications are common. So if you're an elderly person or you have an underlying disease, you should not wait to get anti-flu medication. You know, one of the interesting things in reading about everything that you write about, Dr. Fauci, is it's been 100 years uh, since that, that lethal 1918 flu. And you're saying there could be one virus that could be catastrophic. Today's morning rounds, this flu season is on track to be one of the worst in recent history. In terms of the number of people infected, flu is now widespread in almost every single state, and nearly 10 million people have become ill so far. 4,800 of those people have died. Pediatric deaths are double what they were this time last year, and Dr. Tara Narula is here to help us understand why. So 32 children have died so far from the flu this year. Why is it up so much? So it's interesting. This year, you know, the word we use about the flu is unpredictable. And it's this flu season started earlier than in the past, and the Centers for Disease Control says it's the most widespread outbreak it has ever seen. Officials say doctors' visits are climbing and pediatric deaths from the flu are up as well, at least 20 so far. The CDC says the flu leads to the deaths of thousands of Americans each year. To bring us the latest on the current flu season, we're joined by Dr. Amber Robbins. She's a family medicine physician at Georgetown University and the Health and Media Fellow here at the News Hour. Dr. Robbins, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Why is this season so bad? This season is bad because this year we're seeing more people with influenza A. 
Take a look. You see all that red? I mean, how could you not? That should be a red flag about just how bad this year's flu season has gotten. The CDC says influenza is widespread in all but two states and Washington, D.C. It's that map, that rampant spreading virus we should be worried about. Let's bring the focus back to where health officials here say it should be, the flu. the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here um, staggers me. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Malcolm, but I think things are a little bit different than you and I had feared. Yeah, yeah I know. They're a lot worse. Now, wait a second. Now, we haven't even seen the point no, of no, the no, no, don't, don't let him talk. There's no reason. No, no, I want to hear every viewpoint. I really do. Yeah, yeah. Don't you see the danger, uh, John, inherent uh, in what you're doing here, genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. If this H1N1 pandemic influenza virus had appeared in November or the beginning of December, we would have incorporated it into one of the components of the seasonal flu, and no one would be asking the question. They're looking for someone to blame.